Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I believe we are live now. I'm double checking with my team. Okay, great. My name is Diego. I'd like to briefly come on and explain that we're having some technical issues this afternoon. We are working very diligently to make sure everything is right on track. However, you know how technology is. It often decides to take a break right when we need to get going, and we're very excited to be with you today. Thank you for your patience. We'll wait until my associate Arlene lets me know that we are ready to go and our technical issues have been solved, and then we'll proceed with our event. Thank you. I suspect that we will not proceed until access is ready, and then we will get this ball rolling. And I have just heard that we are ready to roll. So let me introduce myself again. My name is Diego Guerra. My mandatory pronouns are they, them, and theirs. My title is Community Engagement Coordinator at National Deaf Center. I've been working here for over four years now, which is pretty amazing. I'll go ahead and start here in a moment. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce the panelists. We're thrilled to have them joining us today and learning from students from their experiences during the pandemic and how their colleges and universities shifted and changed, how they moved with the times. It was a lot of uncertainty and doubt having to work together to support each other. And we are looking forward to learning from them and the experiences they had with their disability services office. Okay, we'll have one hour, maybe slightly less than an hour today, but we will move through these questions and, and be here with the panelists. We encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A feature. We'll do our best to answer all of your questions as time allows. If we run out of time, our plan will be to send out additional information after the fact, and please reach out to our help team at any time if you have any more questions. We're excited to continue. I think it's time now to begin. You know what? Let me take a moment. I think I'm so excited today. I wanted to jump right in. First of all, I'd like to let you know that we have a handful of announcements available that have populated in your chat box. If you feel unsure about what NDC is all about, please take a look there in the chat box. There's a short paragraph as to what we're all about. We are using captioning today. There's a stream text link, again, in your chat box. If you're having any issues, please reach out to the people in, behind the scenes who are able to support you. You are able to get in touch with them via the chat box. So you all know this will be recorded and archived for future use and viewing. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen and submit those questions. All right, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the panelists now. Each of them will come on screen, give their name, where they're from, which school they represent or attend, and give a brief explanation about their major, their passions, and what's their, what they're really excited about. All right, so I'd like to invite the panelists on screen now, please. Hi, hello everyone, lovely to see you all. Hi, hello. All right, y'all ready to start? Yes. Great, let's start with Jules first. Take it away, Jules. Hello, my name is Jules Good. I use they, them pronouns. I'm voicing today because my arthritis is really bad. <laughs> um, and I just finished up my master's in public policy at the University of New Hampshire. Um, and I'm very excited to be here with everyone else today and learn more about all of our experiences navigating um, academia as deaf students. Fantastic, thank you. And congratulations, Jules. That is a huge achievement for you. Congratulations on that accomplishment. All right, I'd like to hand it over to Isabella now. Hi, I'm Isabella. I'm a first year student at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm studying here auditory science. 
And my interests are, I like art, mostly art. In fact, I love art. So that's me. Thank you, Isabella. All right, Natasha. Hi, I'm Natasha. And I just went back for my second degree in criminal justice at Palm Beach State College. And the reason I'm in criminal justice is because it's been a passion of mine since I was a child. And I'm finally there. And I'm happy to be a part of the panel with you all today. Fantastic. Tristan? Folks, hi, I'm Tristan. Last name Bolig. My name sign. My pronouns are he, his. I'm a former student at MATC, the technical college. I was there for four years, and I've gone back for one more semester uh, because I'm very interested in videography. And also, I've taken, I'm taking audio classes so that I can edit audio on video. And again, that's me here again at Madison Area Technical College. Great. Thank you, Tristan. We are so excited to start today. Now, we've got a couple of questions, but first we'd like to start with polling the audience. The first poll question will populate on the screen and we'd like to ask each of you to answer that. If you feel like it doesn't apply to you, that's quite all right. You don't have to answer. If you find one that you do identify with, please answer that and it'll remain confidential. We'd just like to get a sense of your experiences. The first poll question is now on your screen. The first question reads, how would you rate the transition from in-person to online classes during the pandemic at your specific college? There are three options. Was it easy and well-coordinated? Not bad, only a few adjustments necessary. Or wow, that was really difficult. There was a lot to learn. All right, Arlene, could you let us know the results when you're ready? All right, now what you see on screen are the responses. Let's see, 7% say it was pretty easy and well-coordinated when moving online. Now, then we have 52% saying it wasn't bad. There were just a few adjustments needed to make that change. Lastly, we have 41% and it was difficult and there was a lot to learn. Are any of you panelists surprised with those answers? Somewhat, yeah. And Natasha here saying, I'm surprised, yeah. So this is Diego. I'd like to ask you now your first question. Would you mind sharing your experience in participating and taking classes during the pandemic? What worked well? What were your challenges and struggles? Could, would you all mind sharing that? Who'd like to go first? Tristan? Sure, I'll go first. When I went back to college for a semester, and I'm just talking about last year in spring for those audio classes I mentioned, Again, it's something that really interests me and I'd like to learn more about. We had heard about the pandemic and uh, it was still in China at that point. But when the pandemic hit the mainland here, everything changed in terms of my classes. The school was in a lockdown state and I couldn't attend a physical class. And being the only deaf student in the class, I had limited access to information there were no live captions. When the professor pr presented, I'd have to wait a couple of days to get the material from class. And typically I was used to having those discussions in the classroom, exactly about audio, again, talking about audio effects and how they apply on video. So that conversation was also truncated and I didn't have access to it. And other people who could hear had quicker access to the professor than I did. So I felt that I was left behind by a lot. And it was very challenging for me to get caught up. This is Diego. Would anyone else like to share their thoughts? 
Sure, Jules. Yeah, so uh, it was interesting in New Hampshire, it was kind of uh, late hitting us compared to maybe uh, more populated parts of the country. Um, and so basically the, the spring of when it hit, we had left for spring break and then didn't come back and everything was online. Um, and it wasn't terrible because there was captioning available. Um, what was really difficult was they decided to open campus for the following fall semester, so last fall semester. And there was a mask mandate, obviously, which was a good thing, um, but it made it very, very difficult for me to attend class um, because I really rely heavily on lip reading and there were a limited number of interpreters. Um, and so there were a lot of times where I was not able to, I had a really hard time understanding what was going on. I, the only thing available to me was an FM system. So I would put that up near the professor's desk um, so that I could kind of hear a little bit through my hearing aids, but it was exhausting. <laughs> This is Diego. Yeah, I can imagine. Goodness. Natasha, or, I'm sorry, did anyone else want to respond as well? So, yeah, please. Isabella? Hi, yeah, this is Bella. So I had a really similar experience. In fact, I grew up oral and using speech all through high school. I had a hard time. I had to struggle and fight with the school because they wouldn't give me even the basic accommodations, just basic access I couldn't get. And so I guess they thought because I could speech and use speech reading, I could quote function more. So then I transitioned to college and it was a whole new world, totally different. I had accommodations, no problem. And again, this is my first year. And so my college experience has entirely been during COVID and this pandemic. And so I think for me, I, I guess it probably wasn't the best, but I so appreciated having an interpreter now. That was different. And I know before um, I had used captioning, but now, you know, with everything online, and there's there's more technology, but also more technical difficulties. So for me, um, interpreters are able to really advocate well for themselves. So if they don't understand something or communication isn't happening, they will wave down the professor and say, hey, can you repeat that? So it's not the same for us as it is for interpreters. And so I did feel like um, the transition from high school was a huge improvement for me, but still, I feel like it, it, it certainly wasn't perfect. Um, and I'm hopeful that in the future, it'll just get better and better. So, yeah. Sure, Natasha. Right. I have a similar experience uh, to the panelists. And I think there are pros and cons to being online. Of course, being in a physical setting, you have visibility of the interpreter and the professor being online it's a little different it's almost you have to interrupt you have to mute yourself unmute yourself and it's frustrating for for the professor on my part from what i noticed because of those interruptions and then with blackboard being a completely different system and it's voice activated when the professor would speak i couldn't see the interpreter and that was quite frustrating so I asked how I could see the professor and the professor told me that it's an audio based system and that only I'd only be able to see them. So I made a complaint to the DSS office and they provided me two two platforms, the Zoom and the Blackboard platform. However, it was difficult because I had to split the screen between both platforms. And it's tough to share video with two platforms. You have to turn one off to share your video. Another con. is that in a physical class, I have an interpreter and a note taker. And it's tough to capture everything that's going on in a physical classroom like that. But online, I could just take a quick picture and snap that information and have that. And so in terms of handouts, those get sent to us when we're online. 
But regardless, whatever issue I experience, I go ahead and speak up and I make that uh, make th make that and, and I inform the DSS office so that they can resolve my issues. And it's worked out for me well by doing that. This is Tristan. This is a good reminder, Isabella, what you mentioned. Also, Natasha, thank you. That reminds me when you mentioned the interpreter. I had forgotten about that. I'll speak again in terms of those audio classes. I had an interpreter in the physical classes that was there with me doing all that editing and they would hear things for me and let me know that the sound was on track with the transition to everything being online. I had a similar experience to what was mentioned here. Uh, the interpreter wasn't next to me. They couldn't hear the same sound that I was hearing. So I was uh, kind of left on my own working on the computer on projects. And I try my best to work on the audio and then I'd send it over to the interpreter, ask them to give me feedback on the audio. And every now and then we would meet on Zoom or via email, depending on the interpreter schedule, because they also have other students to work with. There were a lot of conflicts, and I think it made it tough to have access to an interpreter uh, for my audio sound program. So thank you both for reminding me of those issues. This is Diego. You know, it's a lot of extra work for all of you. It's amazing to watch all it of sure the things is. that you're saying. We have a question from the audience, and they're asking if any of your disability services offices used remote interpreting or VRI, Video Remote Interpreting Agencies, and if they did, was it successful or were there some challenges? No? This is Tris. Oh. All right, uh, Tris, you first. This is Tristan. When things happened, I engaged my professor much more, but I'd have to say, no, no that wouldn't apply to me, no. Jules? Yeah, um, so that wasn't presented as an option for us, um, but there were a couple of times where the audio quality coming from the professor was so bad that the captions weren't picking it up. And so I would use VRS and dial an interpreter and it was like it's so frustrating because it's basically you spend like the first 20 minutes of a class trying to get your access needs set up and you're missing all of this information in the meantime so it was it was super frustrating <laughs> this is bella you know that happened to me too like sometimes a professor this they would just schedule something in that moment but I didn't have a time. I didn't have time to like schedule an interpreter. I didn't even have that two or three day, which is what they often require to get an interpreter. So I would have to call VRS myself, kind of like what you said, Jules. And it wasn't always the best. You know what I mean? This is Diego. That is so frustrating. Absolutely. You know, I think this is a great segue for our next question. And before we jump into that second question, turns out we have a second poll question for the audience. We'll get that up here on screen. Did your accommodations change when your classes moved online? The options are yes, no, and sometimes. All right, Arlene, whenever you're ready, if you could populate those answers for us. Great, here are the results. What I'm seeing is 43% say yes. The accommodations did in fact change when you moved your classes online. 19% said they stayed the same and 38% said sometimes. So we kind of had mixed responses. Thank you all for your answers to that question. I'd like now to ask each of you panelists your experience specifically related to that moment when classes transitioned to completely being online, what was your experience like in terms of your accommodations? And could you also explain the process that you went through, the relationship that you have with the disability services offices there at your college campus? Is it good? Is it easy? Is it difficult? Are they just super busy? I'd just like to hear a little bit about each of your experiences. Natasha? Right. At PBC, they've already had services in place 
and they have great services for deaf students. And I'm glad about that. With the transition to being online, that was new because of having to deal with the interpreter and how that shows up. I think in any time of transition, we have to make sure that the interpreter services are there from the start and not second place. But I did have that complaint about Blackboard, and I made that recommendation for that change so that I could have access to the interpreter. Now that stayed in place for my second class, and I also had a consistent interpreter, and things went fine after that. Very nice. Yeah, they were really smooth afterwards. This is Diego. I'm so glad you had that great experience. That makes me happy. Tristan? This goes along with what I was saying earlier. Working via Zoom, when we transitioned online, it was tough because my audio professor was really busy and had a real busy schedule and couldn't really meet with me. So I had to have patience because a lot of the information was just put on Blackboard and we didn't have any live meetings. What the professor would do was just record it, upload it, and share it with the students. They had immediate access, but that left me out. The professor didn't include any captions, and I had to wait a couple days, maybe three days or more, depending on the schedule, just to figure out what was said, what was due, what type of project I was working on. Well, basically all the details. And that's how the professor managed his schedule, which made things tough for me. This is Diego. Yeah, that's, that's definitely not equivalent access and just not fair. Mm -hmm. Bella, Jules, would either of you like to respond? Sure, Jules. Yeah, um, so I had kind of a unique experience. Um, I have a progressive hearing loss that gets like worse every year, pretty much. And so when I started college, my accommodations looked really different than what they were when I finished college. Um, and so the my case file in the accessibility office hadn't really been updated um, when we went into pandemic mode. And so they thought I was still dealing with a mild to moderate hearing loss, but I was really dealing with a severe to profound hearing loss. And so really, really lucky that there is a wonderful person in um, the disability services office who's the assistive technology coordinator. And um, normally like they can't really do anything until you get all the medical documentation to update your case. And then they can kind of let you have accommodations according to that. Um, but she was just like, nope, like this is what you need. The situation is changing. Um, and so we'll get you, you know, what you need. So she was able to get me a new FM system uh, that could plug into my computer so that the sound could go through my hearing aids because I can't really do headphones that well. Um, and also was just super good about um, <laughs> harassing my professors into sending her any, any video content ahead of time so that she could go through and caption it um, before uh, it was due to be watched. And so I was, I'm like so, so grateful for her because I think without her, I would not have been able to do it. Wow. Wow. Oh, you were lucky. That is, I mean, this is Diego. Kudos to that person. That is amazing. I, I'm thrilled to hear that. And this is Jules. Yeah, she was awesome. Ella? Yeah, this is Bella. Um, it was mostly positive. Um, I think, you know, with the Disability Services Office, they have great services and the counselor there is deaf. She's deaf as well. And so that was really great. But the professors, a little bit different story. Um, so before, you know, I changed my major but, and before I got into auditory sciences, I was a biomedical engineer major because I was just always super interested in technology, medical technology specifically. But that major, that environment was not accessible like at all. My teacher, my professors just gave us a lot of videos to watch, learning how to use different software and stuff like that. But it was never, literally never captioned. And sometimes the assignments were due like 
in a week, but the captioning wasn't finished for three weeks, sometimes four weeks, because the captioning office is super duper busy, right? So it was just, my professors never really understood why I needed captioning, why I needed some flexibility with my due dates and assignments. So yeah, for me, the, the office, disability services offices, they were wonderful, but I just think that the STEM field is not there yet. They just don't really get it, like for accommodations and making accommodations for people with disabilities. And I also have a physical disability. And so I experienced a whole lot of medical emergencies. And I would let the professor know and say, hey, I, I need some flexibility with this. And they would just respond and say, nope, sorry, we can't do it, sorry. And so for me, that was really, really frustrating. And I had to change my accommodations a lot. You know, I think it started out the first semester, um, you know, I had full-time classes and I didn't need a lot of accommodations, but then by the end of the semester, I wasn't even taking full-time anymore. I was down to like nine hours worth of classes. And so, yeah, it was, it was really hard. And people tell me that auditory sciences and that field is better. It's a lot more accessible. So I'm really hopeful that it's true for me as well. This is Jules. I guess, you know, you'll see. This is Diego. I'm seeing kind of a common theme amongst all of you. It's kind of more about how the teachers and professors may not be doing their part in terms of accessibility, whereas the disability services offices and your experiences are really working well with you. But there seems to be a gap between them and the professors who need to kind of step up and really make sure that their content is in fact accessible. This is Tristan. Yeah, that would make it more equitable. Yeah, and this is Bella again, sorry. But, um, you know, I think for me, the disability services offices, they always tell me, you know, we're doing everything we can, we are talking to the professor, but we're kind of under their purview. And if, if they say that they're not able to change something, the professor say, sorry, then they're kind of stuck. So that's been my experience. Yeah, this is Diego. There's a question from the audience, maybe more of a comment that I'm noticing here. So, so are, are you all continuing to use interpreters even after the transition to online? And if so, what are some things that interpreters can do to improve your experiences in online classes? Sure, Tristan. For my audio class in that transition online, uh, the interpreter was still provided to me. Of course, they had a, their office at home and their work email where I was able to reach out and be in touch with them. Sometimes I did have the opportunity to meet with them for a Zoom meeting. And again, like I said, uh, they had their own schedule dealing with other students, uh, but I did have access to the interpreter. And it was fine for me, but the timing was an issue because the timing was thrown off everywhere, left and right. This is Natasha. I have had a consistent interpreter. But then when it came time to giving a presentation, I had to make sure that I had the interpreter ready. So I prepped them with my notes. I let them know what I was going to be presenting on. So that way, when I went ahead and presented, they were on point and matched my presentation. That was great advice I received about prepping the interpreter. And so things went really smooth for me. The first time I was a little anxious and the professor called me and asked me to go ahead and present. And the interpreter and I got a little anxious because we hadn't rehearsed. And so we learned from that experience and we rehearsed from then on out. And I had a smooth experience after that. This is Tristan says, Natasha, that's a fascinating answer because I tried prepping the interpreter. Right. And it's interesting that you had a chance to get that out ahead of time. I really didn't have that opportunity. And this is Natasha. I am fortunate in the sense that my professor is extremely flexible and understood that it wasn't equitable and understood that hearing people don't have to rely on an interpreter and that I have to work with the interpreter and be able to come together with them. And so I did want things to work out smoothly and I informed the professor of that and they understood it and worked with me on it. 
This is Diego. Well, goodness, we are about halfway through our hour. Time just flies. Let's go ahead and proceed with our third poll question. If we could have that populated on screen. So what created the most stress or frustration about online learning during the pandemic? Multiple options here. One of them is navigating the virtual learning environment, navigating remote accommodations, lack of information, lack of resources, and finally communication. All right, let's see the answers here. The responses, we have 42% said navigating virtual learning was the most stressful, okay. We have 21% saying navigating remote accommodations. And then 5% lack of information, 16% say lack of resources. And finally, 16% indicated communication. Thank you, Arlene. So now I'll ask you panelists our third question. So when classes shifted to the online space, what support did you receive that you really appreciated to make sure that you were able to continue through taking your classes? Or what was the lack of support? However you'd like to respond. This is Diego. Now, I know that you all have spoken a little bit about your positive experiences with the DSS offices. Um, I am curious if you could expand maybe a little bit more, even, even on that is fine. All right, Bella. So my disability services office, um, they have groups for dis different disabilities. So um, that way you can like meet other people with a similar disability. And for some reason, they don't have a group for deaf people. Now, I know in the past, I think maybe like three years ago, they had a group for deaf and hard of hearing people. But for whatever reason, they don't have it now. I was lucky though, uh, there was a group for people who have autism. And so, uh, yeah, so I was able to kind of hang out, share my experience with other people who also have autism. So that was really good. But I do wish that there was more social support, social activities that engaged deaf people and got us together. I think it would be good. You know, I think maybe there's only even one or two other deaf people on campus, but I didn't get to connect with them. I didn't get to meet them on campus. So that would have been good. Um, and I always, you know, sometimes I think when you, you know, starting a group for deaf people on campus would be good, but you know, I, I don't know um, how to find those other people, you know? All right, Jules. Oh, okay. So we'll go with Jules and then Tristan. I was just going to say on that note, um, I, in the four years attending my university, I met one other deaf person. And the only reason I met her was because I noticed that she was wearing a CI. Um, <laughs> I was walking behind her and I saw her cochlear implant and I was like, oh, are you deaf? I'm deaf. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it is interesting how little like of that socialization there is. Tristan? Thank you, Diego. Before the pandemic, my DSS office, I didn't really need them, but they would reach out to me. And we'd have meetings and discussions just to check in on how classes are going and if I'm experiencing any issues. So I have a great relationship with the DSS office there. After the pandemic, if I remember correctly, it was the middle of spring semester, late February, I'm not exactly sure when the transition happened, basically, and we all went to remote distance learning around that timeline, that wasn't a problem for me. I was already halfway through the semester. I thought to myself, now I struggled. I was very frustrated, but I knew I was close to the end. Now, my college does offer 
that semester of that pandemic, if somebody didn't want to be online or, or couldn't manage things, they refunded that semester. And being that it was half done, they did offer half the money back. I think that was a nice thing for them to offer, but I went ahead and completed the course anyway. This is Diego. Well, that's a nice option. Natasha? Right. Uh, right before the pandemic, for my first degree, graphic design, I was attending classes, and I was the only deaf person in a sea of hearing people with an interpreter, of course. And I did have a bad experience that I'll just touch upon briefly. I had a professor ask me, why do you have an interpreter here? I responded, because I'm deaf. And the professor said, well, no, I consider it cheating. That was a big impact on me. I persisted. And despite my persistence, I got a bad grade. I completed all my assignments on time and I got a bad grade. I complained to the DSS office and they said that they thought that the interpreter was answering for me. So I dropped that class. That was a horrific experience. And I decided to find uh, the same class with a different professor. I waited to the following fall and I had a new professor and I had a better experience. And then I did see that original professor and I didn't want to give them the cold shoulder, but I did ignore them and just move on. And I thought, wow, for someone to think that the interpreter is helping me cheat, they obviously do not understand deaf culture. They obviously do not understand access and access needs. And that hurt me. And then also, why I changed my major from graphic design to criminal justice, I was really impacted by these types of stories. There was a person in particular uh, that is deaf, and they were looking at some work that someone else was doing, and they said, I want to do that. And I said, why not? And they said, well, because I'm deaf and I can't. And I didn't like that response. It weighed heavily. And I thought, you know, once I was done with my first degree, I thought I need to get a second degree. Now that person I interacted with, I didn't ask their name, but uh, I went ahead and saw them at another college and I realized, you know what, I can return and I can get a degree in criminal justice and work to change things. So I went ahead and did so. Tristan here says, what an awful experience to have to go through. Certainly, this is Bella. You know, I think sometimes people just don't expect deaf people to succeed and to do well. And they just don't set up the system to help us succeed. And they just think, oh, they can't do it anyway. So why bother? But, you know, if they don't set up the system in such a way to help us, well, then obviously we're not going to succeed. So that it's just a cycle, you know, and it perpetuates that cycle. This is Diego. I agree 100%. This is Bella. I had that experience, like I mentioned in the STEM program, there weren't a lot of deaf people and still aren't a lot of deaf people in STEM programs. And I think we need to take a minute and think about why. You know, it's just that accessible in the first place. So that plays a huge role. This is Diego and Natasha. It's an issue with hearing. Right. My dad always said deaf people have great eyes and they can catch things with their eyes. And it's just an issue of sound. And it's true. Right. My eyes are my best tool. They capture everything for me. I had a teacher in the past say, you can use your eyes to memorize spelling. You can hear words, but that doesn't tell you how they're spelled. But with vision, you can see how there's how things are spelled. And I've applied that philosophy to my degree in criminal justice. And thanks to my father for also mentioning that. We can't let a lack of hearing stop us from achieving our dreams. We can reach those goals that we want. We can accomplish what we want. Right, says Tristan. It just takes hard work, and we can do that. This is Diego. Oh, so powerful and unique. Thank you so much for sharing each of your stories. And I can relate to that as well. I think back to my college days and, and my own experiences. Goodness, thank you. Turns out we have a really great question here from the audience. Someone has typed in, my college is still going strong during this challenging time during COVID. They remain positive. They hosted multiple virtual events. They continue to host those. I'm just wondering if any of your colleges 
hosted any of those type of virtual events that you were able to attend? And if so, do they provide accommodations for you if you'd like to attend those events? Natasha? I can respond with a yes. I always want to participate in any virtual or online event. Now, prior to participating, I do ask in advance. I make a request for an interpreter and have it ready ahead of time. I think it's critical to always ask ahead of time. This is Diego, definitely. Anyone else have any experience with that? This is Tristan. You know, I was way too focused on my program to even think of participating with online events. Yeah. Sure, this is Bella. I know, uh, you know, we have Zoom and they offer um, auto captions. Um, so for some campus events, they use that. I do continue to ask for an interpreter even in light of that, but I am surprised more and more. I'm hearing people are using captioning now, so that's something. This is Diego. Yeah, that's a good thing. Okay, so let's proceed with the last question. So for your disability services offices at your particular college, what do you wish that they could change or what do you wish they knew about your experience and how they could, in terms of how they could improve or something that they're doing really, really well? Jules? So one thing that I noticed a lot um, and not necessarily for myself, like I said, I really lucked out with the people I was working with in my disability office, but um, there were a number of my peers who um, were not able to get accommodations when we switched to online because they didn't have the right um, documentation and they weren't able to go see a doctor in like the height of the pandemic to get that documentation to then give to the, the, um, the disability office. So um, I, I thought that was really, I found that really frustrating. Um, and I think it's, you know, I understand why there's a need for documentation, but sometimes I think that disability offices can forget how difficult that can be for people to access, even in normal times, you know, sometimes you have to go see a specialist to get a specific diagnosis and for people who are uninsured or who, um, you know, aren't as financially stable, that can be really difficult to have to go through that process. And so I feel that there are probably a lot of students who aren't getting um, the accommodations they need because they are either afraid to go through that process or they're unable to go through that process. Um, and so I just wish that disability offices were less stringent about that, especially in the midst of a global pandemic. This is Tristan. Thank you, Jules. That was good advice. This is Bella. You know, my school, um, I wish, so for deaf people, you know, we need more than just physical support, right? Or for me, auditory support. We need mental health support. This kind of work is exhausting and it can impact your mental health. This is Jules and emotional health. This is Bella, you know, so I feel like schools need more, um, maybe like a holistic type uh, view or approach in terms of what disabled people need. And, you know, we all have different needs and this is true, but there is one common theme amongst all of us and that's mental health support. And I think we should focus on that. Tristan? For myself, my professor and I, we know each other, and they're a cool person. Uh, they understand that with their schedule, that caused me to get behind. And we were good with that. But on a wider level, I wish that the DSS office or any professors with deaf students, that's the key. A person like me, a deaf student, I wish a professor would understand ahead of time that a live event without a captioner is going to be an issue. 
and not move forward without that. That is inequitable. They should have access in mind. They can provide notes before a live event. They can reach out to an interpreter and have that ready ahead of time. They can really work on providing access and front load that. I really wish that social media, anything live, had the option of having captions, just like we're doing now. It's the same idea. I think it needs to be developed where it populates quicker and not so delayed because it's just behind. So anyone that's deaf or anyone else that's depending on captions is way behind. And with technology at the level it's at today, I believe it's possible. This is Bella. You know, often I think it's just a second thought. It's nothing they think of in advance. Exactly, says Tristan. Yes, says Natasha. I had told uh, DSS, the DSS office ahead of time to prepare Zoom for deaf people. And in the future, when we return to physical classes, I always want to mention that you've got to caution your deaf professors and the DSS offices uh, ahead of time. And to add that interpreters aren't there to cheat for the deaf student. And as deaf students, we also have a chance to make a complaint or a grievance where they can add or change policies. Now, I'm not looking to get a professor fired, but I do want to find some type of policy that can give a professor a pause and maybe change their thinking so that they don't target a student who has an interpreter. So policy change is one way to get this done. And another issue that happens sometimes is other students mock deaf students in the classroom, right? A lot of times they make faces or make comments or they say, well, I can't focus on the professor because your interpreter is distracting me. And, you know, in that sense, what can I really do about it? As a deaf person, I want access. I had a student ask me, why don't you go to a deaf college? And because they said, we have one nearby. And I thought, well, I grew up in a hearing society and I've been mainstream, right? And I have the right to make my own choice of what college I attend. And instead of thinking of that oppression of what it was, I realized that I can communicate with the DSS office, whether it's an issue with a hearing student or a professor, I always bring that to the DSS office so that they can create those policies. If we don't do that, that provides a chance for others to fail. Remember, we have a voice. We need to speak up and use it. This is Diego. You know, it's great that you have a DSS office that's willing to back you up when a professor gives you a hard time. I'm thinking way back, but, you know, to my college years, DSS always was, that was my go-to office if I had any issues with any access um, at all. So that was really nice. And I'm glad that most of you have that as well. So we have 10 minutes left, which is fantastic because that makes us more available to our audience and their questions here live during the event. So uh, one of them is, uh, it was one of you, it might have been Natasha, said that you had a note taker back when you were in in-person classes, but now online, do you still have note takers or do you have to take your notes on your own and look between the paper and an interpreter? Natasha? Right. When we were in physical classes, I did have a note taker, but now that we are online, there are no students volunteering to take notes. Of course, right? Because it's online, they just expect someone else to do it. And obviously, we just can't see what other students are doing in an online class. So, for example, on Blackboard, there are usually summaries, but then the teacher or the professor will expand on those in person. So, I've made several complaints. I think it was a week or two uh, before I contacted DSS. First, I sent information to the professor. And then after that, I followed up with the DSS and the professor in the same email. I don't want to split that communication. I'd rather communicate with both parties at the same time. Soon after that, I was able to get an agenda and notes ahead of time. And the professor, because they have their own notes, was able to forward those to me. And I was able to work with those. Going through that process and doing what I did made it much easier. So don't wait. This is Tristan. I don't rely on notes, but like I said, my professor would video record his presentation and then I had to wait a couple of days for the captions. 
So once the captions were there, it just like subtitles in a movie, right? Then I was able to watch them anytime I'd like, and I was able to watch them repeatedly. I don't know how that worked for anyone else. Uh, I'm sure some folks could ask a professor for a transcript or ask the classmates to take notes for them or rely on an interpreter. I don't know, but I was fortunate enough that I was able to just replay the videos once they had the captions and able to learn that way. Natasha says, Tristan, that was very fortunate of you. Very lucky. I had to review the videos without an interpreter, which made it kind of difficult and tough. So that was a drawback. Yeah. And Tristan here responding, right. See, my professor and I, we know each other and we're friends. And he's been fascinated by but the work I do. And so we know each other well. So he understood my needs and was able to satisfy them. This is Diego. Yeah, for sure. Now, everybody's super excited to get a hold of you and ask all these questions. Um, so we have a whole list here. There's a comment here. They said, all of you panelists are amazing. I wish I could work with you. So thought I'd put that out there. You guys are fabulous people. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you. All right, so this is Diego again. Have any, with another question, have, have any of you ever filed a grievance? Do you have any experience with submitting that through the dean's office or the DSS office because of an issue with a teacher struggling to get captioning or any kind of access issues? Do you, any of you have experience with that? This is Tristan, not me. And Natasha says me neither. Do you think it would have been helpful? Tristan, not Natasha, yes. This is Natasha, we have rights, yes. Yeah, Tristan says, you're not in a position where you have to take what's being shelled out at you. You have rights and you need to stand up for them. If you feel you're not being treated fairly, go ahead and use whatever procedure is in place. Natasha says, if you can't use your voice, then go ahead and use your hands to write something out and you'll surprise people. Make your grievance however you have to. Let people realize that we are intelligent. Don't let people continue thinking we're dumb. Let's show them our intelligence that we have. And this is Tristan. I've been studying audio. I'm very fascinated by it. I can't hear, but that's not an excuse. I love that. And that's proof. If you love something, go for it and do it. And this is Natasha Wright. Criminal justice is a difficult subject, but I'm going for it. I've taken that huge step because my goal is to help other deaf people by fixing the wrongs in the system. That's my goal is to accomplish that for deaf folks and individuals so that they can get jobs, so that they can gain employment. A to Z, I want to change the world for deaf individuals to have more access and equity. Amazing. This is Jules and Diego, 100%. This is Bella. So, you know, I'm in auditory science, right? So being a deaf person, we rely on others often. And so I want to understand more about the deaf community. And I want to include a deaf perspective in audiology and in those fields. For sure. This is Diego. We have roughly four minutes left. So I'm going to ask you if you have any kind of final thoughts or comments that you'd like, or any advice that you'd like to give to DSS professionals or folks that work in those offices. Any advice, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience today? Tristan? I have a huge piece of advice for the DSS office. Make sure you work things out because every disability is different. Every individual is different in the type of accommodation they need. There's no one size fits all. You need to make sure with the individual, regardless if they're online or in a physical class, that the accommodation is a good fit for them. I know it can be overwhelming, but there's a lot of diversity that exists with people with disabilities or deaf people, which means that there will also be diversity in accommodations. And don't brush people off because that is painful and it hurts people when you do that. You'll want to check in and make sure that an accommodation works. When somebody gives you feedback that an accommodation is working, make note of it. That'd be my piece of advice. This is Natasha. Piece of advice that I'd like to give. Let's say you've got two deaf people online. And... Maybe they're following a medical or legal degree.
there's no difference if they have different English literacy levels. Let's say one of the pe deaf people does have a different level in English than the other. Encourage the deaf folks regardless. Don't let your own thoughts stop them. And it's the same idea that sometimes some people think that hearing people are going to achieve more than a deaf person. And that's not the goal. The goal is to have equity. I want to see more deaf people in employment. I want to see a deaf doctor. I want to see a deaf nurse. And so I encourage people to move forward in those pathways. And the main reason that I like to see deaf people in those roles is for the ease of communication. All right, Jules? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, just to kind of reiterate something that we've touched on, I think throughout this panel is if you're a DSS professional um, or a professor, um, you should be seeking each other out <laughs> in your university settings. Because I think what happens at least at my university is the only interaction that professors have with the DSS office is like reading a, a letter that they send on a student's behalf that says you have to do this because of the ADA or whatever. Um, and there's really no further explanation of, yeah, like deaf culture or the mental health challenges that are unique that can come with having a disability. And so I think that there just needs to be more collaboration between those two groups um, and just more um, understanding on the part of professors, because I think sometimes what happens as well is professors assume that you're trying to like take advantage of the system or you're trying to, you know, do something um, to make it easier on yourself, but that's not true. All we're looking for is equality and all we're looking for is the same opportunity to get the same um, quality of education as our hearing peers. Um, and so that's just something I would, I would, I would encourage universities to have that discussion all together. This is Bella. You know, I wish more professionals knew more and just not judge people based on looks. And, you know, some people think like, oh, you might be, you have a higher, you're higher functioning than you really are. And so I just, you know, it's just, it, it doesn't matter how someone looks and everyone's needs are different. It's not like, oh, they're this way, so they need this, or they're this way because they need that. Disabilities vary. We're all unique and different. And I think disability professionals should have a little bit more um, confidence in people and, and kind of help out with self-advocacy because that's how we teach other people. If we have to teach other people how to self-advocate when they're confident, uh, teach people how to express their needs and what it is that they do need. This is Diego, definitely. You know, I'd like to take this time to thank all four of you for your strong advocacy skills. And you all are doing such great things, advocating for yourselves and navigating these huge systemic barriers. That you're just breaking them down for the people who come after you and who follow in your shoes and your footsteps. So I'd like to make a final announcement and I'm very sorry. I was so into the panel today that I forgot to show the first code for CEUs. I am so sorry. We will share both codes with you now That'll be populated in the chat box. So please take a look there, get them exactly as you see them, even copy and paste them into your form to get credit for today's session. Again, I apologize for not sharing that first one earlier. I, it was such a great panel. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> this happens. is Tristan, it happens, yeah. <laughs> it does, thank you, Tristan. Thank you all so much for coming today and joining us. If you have any questions, if you need any help or expansion, any any more thoughts you'd like to share or um, reach out to us, we have help desk available 24 seven. We're not gonna respond at 2 a.m. Know that they can, but they most likely will not, but you are able to reach out to them at help at nationaldefcenter.org.
We have more panels coming up in the future. Please stay tuned for that. Look on social media, like us, follow us on every platform if you haven't yet. Thank you to the interpreters, to our captionists, specifically to our panelists. Thank you, Arlene and our other staff members. I almost said family members. What does that tell you about NDC? Thank you all so much for making this panel a success today. This is Jules. Thank you, Diego. Thank you so much. This is Natasha. Hi, Thank you. And this is Tristan. Thank you.